The Melba Story. The story of Australia's most famous woman. The true story, fully authenticated, and featuring another wonderful Australian singer, Glenda Raymond. The Melba Story. The London season of 1893 proved to be another great success for Melba, whose fame by now was worldwide. It was evident that this young Australian had in a few short years reached the heights, and that very soon, like Alexander, she would have no more worlds to conquer. For now came the call she had expected, a call from the new world of America. Nellie, there's a cable from Maurice Grau at the New York Metropolitan. Oh, what does he say? Can you open at the new Metropolitan in November? November? Well, that's all right, isn't it, Louis? Yes, as long as you can be back in time for the scholar season next year. Oh, I'll manage that. A cable back at once, dear. Just say yes. I didn't think it was possible to build a new opera house so soon. Why, the Metropolitan was only burnt down last year. These Americans have a reputation for getting things done in a hurry. Well, I'm like that too, so we should get along very well. <sighs> if only I didn't have to cross the sea to get there. It may not be so bad this time. And perhaps you'll be a better sailor. No, Louis. I shall hate it. But I'll endure it for the sake of what lies at the end of the journey. You'd better send that cable right away. It's getting late. All right. Oh, by the way, who's the young man outside? Outside where? Just by your dressing room door. A curly-headed youth, long nose and rather nice eyes. Oh, that one. He's always about the place. He seems to be haunting me. Whichever way I turn, I run into him. He's probably following you. Oh, no. You remember what happened in Venice and Milan? Yes, and I don't want any repetition, thank you. Off you go, Louis. And if he's still there, ask him what he wants. He'll be there. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I wasn't expecting the door to open just at that particular moment. Were you listening at the door? Well, not exactly. I was just sort of standing here. Come in here, young man. I... Beg your pardon? I said, come in here. You're not deaf, are you? Oh, no. I heard what you said. Then why did you hesitate? I just couldn't believe my good fortune. Sit down there. Thank you. All right, Louis. You can leave this to me. Nellie, you will be careful this time, won't you? My dear girl, this is London, not Milan. Yes, but human nature seems to be pretty much the same everywhere. <laughs> Poor Louis. After meeting Giovanni, I can't blame her for being a little suspicious. I beg your pardon? Who are you? I'm Landon Ronald. And who may Landon Ronald be? I, I've been engaged as rehearsal pianist here. Hmm. You're very young, aren't you? Oh, no, I'm 20. One foot in the grave, almost. Are you any good? Yes. <laughs> Well, it's a fine thing to have confidence in yourself, but it has to be backed up by real ability, you know. Yes, I know. How many operas do you know? All of them. Every opera that's been written? All the important ones, anyhow. Do you know Mignon? Yes. Well, I'm studying the part of Felina at present, and I need a good pianist. Are you interested? Oh, yes. Very well. Uh, what was your name? Landon Ronald. Very well, Landon Ronald. Come to my hotel tomorrow at 12 o'clock and I'll see what you're made of. Come in. Oh, it's our young pianist. Close the door, my friend, and sit down over there at the piano. Thank you. 
What's the matter? I beg your pardon. You look very pale and your eyes look rather strange. As if you've been practicing this new fad. What's it called? A hypnotism. I'm all right. You don't look very strong. You can't always judge by appearances. No, perhaps not. Well, we'd better get to work. I'll find you a score of mignon. I don't need a score, thank you. I'll play from four bars before your first entry. Here, wait a minute. Not so fast, young man. You know this opera, but it's comparatively new to me. I need the score, even if you don't. I'm so sorry. I don't see anything to laugh at. I beg your pardon. Now, let me see. Act two, scene two, there's a polonaise. I know. Je suis Titania. Take it from two bars before the tempo moderato. Right. young man. Why? To be able to play any part of an opera from memory. Oh, I, I'm not sure that I could quite do that. You mean that you know Mignon perhaps better than any other opera? Well, I, I know it. So it seems. Well, I don't know it, except for this aria which I've been studying with Tosti. Shall we try it? Whenever you're ready. You don't mind if I keep the score? Oh, not at all. I don't need it. Very well. Begin from the same place.
beautiful. Thank you. Your playing was a great help. And you have a wonderful memory. Did it take you many weeks to learn Mignon by heart? It took me about six hours. What? I borrowed the school last night and set up learning it until daylight. Then when I asked you if you knew Mignon... I'd never heard of it. Why, you... You... <laughs> oh, you, you ridiculous young man. In just a moment, we'll return to the Melba story. The Melba story. You mean to tell me, young man, that... You learnt the whole score of that opera by heart in one night? Yes. <laughs> no wonder you look half dead. Oh, it was my only chance to play for you. Now, if I'd said I didn't know Mignon, you'd have sent me away, wouldn't you? Probably. But that was no excuse for telling lies. No. And you let me think that you knew every opera just as well. Oh, I do know quite a lot. And now I can add Mignon to the list. Mm, you're a very wicked young man, Landon Ronald. Yes, I know. But you're also a very determined young man. You're not really angry with me, are you? Have you ever been to America? No, oh, I've never been out of England. I'm going to America later in the year. How wonderful. I'll need a pianist. You mean... You mean... You play very well. If you'd like to engage yourself exclusively to me, I think we could do business. And what do you say? What do I say? Oh, oh. Nellie, we've had another offer. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was anyone with you. It's all right, Louis. This young man is now a member of the family. His name's Landon Ronalds, and he's agreed to be my accompanist. And this Landon is the one who gives us all our orders. My secretary, Louis Bennett. How do you do? I'm not nearly as fearsome as Madame Melba would have you believe, Mr. Ronald. But I do have to keep an eye on things. And what an eye. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, Louis. I can't possibly imagine life without you. Now, what's all this about another offer? Sweden and Denmark in October and November. But you'll have to refuse. Why? You open in New York in December. Well, that's all right. I've always wanted to see those northern countries. Write back and say I'm definitely interested. And if we can come to terms, I can be in Stockholm by the end of October. Nellie, this letter has just reached Stockholm by a special delivery from Norway. Well, open it. But it, it, it has the royal seal on it. Look, Oscar II, King of Norway and Sweden. <laughs> I'm not afraid of kings anymore, Louis. Here, give it to me. <laughs> Nelly, you're so irreverent. Irreverent? I'm speechless. Why? Is it from the king? Yes. And what do you think he says? That I simply must postpone my departure until he comes back from Norway. Well, you can't do it, Nellie. Your American trip... He says he's heard so much of my voice and my art that he'd never forgive himself if I left before his return to the capital. Oh, he doesn't understand. And he asks me to sing a special program for him. Would you like to hear what it is, Louis? Some of his favourite songs, I suppose. Favourite songs? He suggests the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. The whole balcony scene? But that takes more than half an hour, doesn't it? Yes, and I hardly stop singing for a moment of it. Oh, but that's nothing. His Majesty also requests the second act of Lohengrin. What? The third act of Lucia. Oh, no. And the fourth act of Faust. Nelly. Not to mention a few encore numbers, such as Solvig Song from Pierre Gint. Why not the third act of Aida as well? Oh, His Majesty doesn't want to ask too much of me. Of course, it's impossible. Well, I'm not so sure. If you were to cable Maurice Grau and ask for an extra week... But why put yourself to all that trouble? Because King Oscar has such good taste. And now, your 
your majesty. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall sing as my final encore, so big song from Pierre Gint, the words by your own Henrik Ibsen, and the music by your own Edward Grieg. Buonasera, signora. Buonasera, your majesty. But I'm not Italian, you know. No? Then what? I'm an Australian. An Australian? Oh, good. Then we shall talk in Australian. <laughs> I'm afraid your majesty would find that rather difficult. <laughs> then we must be content with English. But before we say anything else, I wish to confer this decoration on you. It is one that we reserve for those who have distinguished themselves in any of the arts. 
You see what it says? Literis et artibus. Ibsen received one of these. So did Grieg. And you, who have glorified the work of both, are even more deserving of it. Oh, Your Majesty. I can't say how proud I am to receive this this unique decoration. Oh, come, it is not so important. And I can assure you, it cost me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but won't you pin it on for me, sir? Yeah, of course I will. If you lend me the pin. A pin? I'm afraid I only have a head pin. A woman without a pin? <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, uh, I think I can find one. <laughs> Shall I look at it? <laughs> no, it, it's quite all right. There you are, sir. Good. And now for the big operation. There. I thank your majesty. Oh. Oh, I have just thought of something. What is it, sir? One ought never to give a pin as a gift. It is supposed to bring ill feeling. But it was my pin. <laughs> Not after you gave it to me. And then, you see, I gave it to you again. Oh, no, no, it is too great a risk. I shall have to take your decoration back. Oh, no. Wait. Wait, I have just thought of something else. Yes, sir? A kiss removes any magic spell. You know that, I suppose. <laughs> I've heard of it, sir. Oh, it never fails. And so, I defy the bad fairies by kissing you on both cheeks. So, and so. Oh, sir. Now, my dear Madam Melba, we are friends forever. When you leave Stockholm, remember that. I could never forget it, Your Majesty. Well, goodbye, my dear. And a safe voyage to America. Louis! Louis, where are you? Here, yeah, Nellie, right oh. alongside you. Oh. But every time the ship rolls, I I'm thrown halfway across the cabin. Oh, why did the lights go out? Oh, there's been some kind of mechanical oh. failure because of the storm. Oh. I shouldn't have come. I know I shouldn't have come. It, it can't go on like this. It must end soon. That's just the trouble. It could end only too soon. Oh, no. There can't be any real danger. Oh, 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 oh. It's the end, Louis. It's the end for us all. A voyage across the Atlantic in 1893. An 8,000-ton liner with a single-screw engine staggers in the path of a fierce tempest. And one passenger, Nellie Melba, who has always hated sea travel, gives up all hope of survival. We'll hear more of her first trip to America in the next chapter of The Melba Story. The Melba Story was written by John Ormiston Reed and produced by Dorothy Crawford. The Australian Symphony Orchestra was conducted by Hector Crawford. The role of Melba was spoken by Marcia Hart and sung by the Australian coloratura soprano, Glenda Raymond.